Things change, do they not? Yes. And it's happening at an ever-increasing pace. Oh, I think one of the quickest changes uh, that happen are, is in language itself. You know, it wasn't too long ago the, the word Meg meant a person. You know, and, and now, you know, or a hard drive was driving from Myrtle Beach to Conway on the 4th of July on 501. <laughs> you know. There was a time when keep off the grass meant stay off my lawn. And a virus was the flu. All those words now mean entirely something different. In this Old Testament text we, we heard uh, from Isaiah, things were about to change. The Jews uh, had suffered uh, the being conquered. Israel and Judah had been carried off into captivity. The Babylonian Empire and the Assyrian Empire had just laid waste uh, to uh, the Palestine area toting away the aristocrats and the intellectuals back into Babylon. And while they were in Babylon, they, they prayed for the day that they could return to Jerusalem. Uh, they had holidays and celebrations about the day they would return to Jerusalem. And then another king, another emperor, another conqueror came over the horizon from, from Iran, what is now modern day Iran, Persia, and Cyrus. And he marched westward and he went into uh, what was then Babylon and he conquered Babylon. And Cyrus was a shrewd Dictator. He was a shrewd emperor. He knew the best way to control people was to control them with language, to control them with custom, and control them with money, coinage. So he pushed Hellenistic ways, the culture and the coins and, and, and uh, the language and the like. Now to the Jews he told them that they could return back to Jerusalem. He was going to grant them the freedom that they had prayed for for so long, for a century even. And he was going to let them take back all the finery from the temple. And he was going to add to that collection other monies and things that would give them support. But at the end, only a few a very small group actually left Babylon and went back to Jerusalem. Why? After praying for so long to go home, go back to the homeland, why did only a few return? Because they had invested in Babylonian culture. They had assimilated themselves into Babylonian ways. They had accepted their lot, their position. And to go back to Jerusalem was to lose their standard of living that they had gained there in Babylon. They would lose it to go back to Jerusalem. So only those most fundamental in the faith, those who were most committed to the faith, went back. They must have not heard the preacher from First Church, Myrtle Beach, say, you can't go with God and stay where you are. And neither did they hear him say, you can't become more than you are by remaining as you are. In a surgeon's office, reads a sign. Resisting change is like holding your breath. If you succeed, you die. Think about it. 
Change is all around us. We're in the midst of it. We may deny it, but it's here. Change was at the very beginning of existence. God brought change. Remember, there was nothing but chaos, and God brought order. Things changed with creation. And every creative step brought change. If you watch the days as they unfold in that creative process, every day brought some form of change. But change is fast-paced today. It makes us uncomfortable. It's all around us. Things that used to take centuries to develop now only takes a week. I'm told by a technocrat in my friendship group, group that today you can actually take an idea to the design board, to the production line, and get it ready to be shipped out within a week. Of course, it depends on how big the product is, but you get the idea. One week, when it took us centuries to develop a shovel. How long did it take us to create the wheel? One week. One week. And I have a friend, uh, a dear friend up in Greenville, who's a GYN oncologist. And he tells me that since he graduated med school, which was a long time ago now, but since he has graduated med school, he has had to read five periodicals and numerous papers every week just to stay even with the new developments, the treatments and the drugs and all that kind of stuff. Five periodicals and numerous papers every week just to stay even. I think it's similar for the human psyche. We know more, but understand far less. We've received more knowledge without learning the implications of the old. In other words, we're overburdened with knowledge and vagabonds and wisdom. The fast-paced and often radical change causes us sometimes just to shut down emotionally. And we say, I'm not changing anymore. That's it. I'm done with it. I'm going to stay just as I am right now. Unless you're in need of Weight Watchers. <laughs> but we shut down. The Christian church has not been, has not been spared this dilemma, this problem. When Robert Schuller stood on the roof of that outdoor movie theater and preached his sermon, he had no idea of what was going to ripple through this country from that. From, from standing on that roof of that movie theater and the creation of the Crystal Cathedral, which I understand now has gone bankrupt, but the ripple effect worship-wise just went through this entire country. and that's. You can lay at the feet contemporary worship and many other forms of worship all the way back to that movement. And, and it sent shockwaves to the Christian church. And in many ways, we, some just refuse to change at all. Some rechange radically. And there's all kinds in between there. And sadly to say, we've gotten to the point now where we don't want to talk to each other. And we say some very cruel and harsh things about the forms of worship that one another have. And even theologians today have a word for it. They call it worship wars. And isn't that sad? That they're talking about the Christian church and using the term worship war. You know, I have to admit, the older I get, the less I like change. You know, there was a time when I really just licked my chops at changing something. And it's not that way anymore, you know. I really get mad at Bill Gates when he changes my Microsoft Word. <laughs> you know, I get, I get set on how to do something and he just messes it all up. And I have to learn new keystrokes or new formats and all that kind of stuff. And it just, you know, gets away with me sometimes. But the older we get, the more we get locked into the way things are, the way we want to do things, because we want to be comfortable. 
We want to do things the same way. So we want routine. And in that is the feeling that we want to be remembered. We want to, we want to go beyond our life and the, and the routines and, and the, uh, the rituals and all that kind of stuff. We hope and pray will exceed us. Whereas if you're younger, you want to invest yourself. You want to stick yourself in there. You want to know that you mean something, that you have some value in the way you uh, find out if you uh, have any kind of power or control in your life is to change something. So you make that change. Now, many years ago, um, I went down to Atlanta, Georgia. And it was a a celebration of, of faith called Promise Keepers. I don't know if any of you ever heard of Promise Keepers or not. Well, I heard about it and was intrigued by it, and I tried to get church members to go, and they didn't want to go. And I tried to get uh, other ministers to go, my colleagues, they didn't want to go either. So I just packed up and went by myself. And I went down there, and it was a remarkable, fantastic event. Now, the Georgia Dome, I was mesmerized by it. I had not seen it before. And I was like, you know, and New Yorkers know when you go to New York. You know how they know when you're in New York? Because you're the one walking around like this. <laughs> well, that was me in the Georgia Dome. Okay, I'm walking around with my head stuck up looking at everything, poking at everything, trying to, to find out how they put this thing together. There's, in that Georgia Dome was 45,000 Christian ministers. And I understand that it's the largest gathering of Christian ministers in the history of the Christian church. It was impressive. And there were people there of every stripe, of every theology, of every color. There were, there were young, there were old, there were ministers there from teeny tiny churches. There was a South Korean minister there that had over 50,000 in his church. Every stripe, tall, short, skinny, and me. <laughs> but you know what? In the midst of all that diversity, when we got to singing, and when we got to praying, we became one. We were one in the Spirit. We were one with the Lord, as the song goes. And although I was there completely by myself, I felt at home. I felt comfortable. And I don't like crowds. But it wasn't crowded. In the midst of 45,000, I did not feel crowded. It was amazing. Now, Promise Keeper started uh, from a coach. His name was uh, McCarney, and he was the coach of Colorado University, at Colorado University, the football team. And it started when one day he was standing on the sideline during a football game, and one of his tailbacks broke loose from the 20-yard line and, you know, did his little thing between everybody and got to the sideline and started up the sideline. And uh, the coach said the whole stadium just stood up and erupted. Now listen to this. He said, over an 18-year-old carrying a pig bladder. <laughs> an 18-year-old carrying a pig bladder. And he said, the next thought haunted his soul. And he said, why can't there be 80-some thousand Christian men stand up and cheer the grace of God? And that's what started Promise Keepers. So I was feeling good. I was having a great time being there uh, with those people. And... Um, I chose to, instead of driving in and back every day, I would ride the MARTA. And I, the motel, I got a motel that was near the headline of the MARTA. And so I'd get up and get on the MARTA and ride it all the way in, into Atlanta. 
Well, one day uh, I got on the train, the, the MARTA train, to ride from the dome back to the motel. Still singing in my head, it only takes a spark. Because that was the closing song for that day. And I thought it was a very poignant message. Because what they were saying to us, you, you feel good right now. You've got all the warm and fuzzies right now. You feel good about yourself and who you are, what you are, why you are. But you know, there's a mission to be done. It's time for you to take the spark into the world. And so I'm, I'm singing the song in my head. And my son that year had given me, and I'm really dating this story, but he had given me a Walkman. Remember those things? Yeah, I had a Walkman, and I was cool. I had, those, I had the ear man, I had it like this, and I was, I was back in the seat. Now, when you're as big as I am, that one, all, one size fit all molded seat doesn't work. Just does not work. So it was a relief to get into a bench seat on the train. And so I'm kind of sprawled out there with the Walkman on, and I'm listening, and, and, uh, and I had Creedus Clearwater on. Remember, remember them? I had CCR on, remember? And I kind of went off into a little sleep. And the train lurched, and I kind of woke up a little bit, and then it lurched again to take away, and then I kind of peeped up. I peeped up, and there was this older woman standing right in front of me, probably in her late 80s, and she had one of these silver things that you pull your your stuff on, uh, suitcase and things, and she had a pocketbook under this arm and she was trying to grab this and, and this and then going back and forth trying to hold on to everything she had. And I looked around the train and there wasn't another seat and I, I, and I remember what my grandmother, Joanna Engel, taught me. So I stood up and I said, would you like my seat? And she said, really? I said, yeah, you can have my seat. So she sat down, and I had to grab a hold. Now I'm doing this. And uh, I don't know, it must have been an expression on my face. But I started looking around the car. And I realized there's other men sitting there, and there's other women standing. And I started looking at the men. And one by one, they started standing up. <laughs> and uh, eventually, the women got seated, and the men got to stand. And the little lady tugged me on the jacket, and I leaned over. This is the one I had let sit in my seat. She tugged me, and I leaned over. She says, I think you started something. <laughs> and then she said, I hope it lasts. You know, it only takes a spark. A spark. Sometimes it's, it's not a big thing at all. On another trip on the Marta, I looked and I saw this very young, attractive, African-American female sitting in a chair with this young, white, obviously um, unkept male. And uh, they were kind of huddled down in the seat. And they, 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 it was obvious they were looking at something. They were talking about something. And as soon as he got up, and if you don't know me by now, I, I, I'm just kind of like this, but as soon as he got up, I made my way up there. And I got up there and sat down behind her, introduced myself, and we began to talk. And finally I asked her, you know, what were you doing? And she said that she was teaching him how to read and write. She was a senior at Spelman College. And I said, really? And I said, how long has this been going on? She said, well, it's been going on for almost a year. And she would give him homework in the morning and check the homework from the night before. And he would go and do that homework at lunchtime at work, come back and she would check that and she would give him homework to take for the night. And he would go and do that and, and it was just a process. And she said, but this is the second one. I said, really? She said, yeah, she, she had gotten on the MARTA one morning and ran into this fellow who was uneducated and he couldn't read the sign on when to get on and get off the train. And when she realized he could not read and write, she told him that she would teach him. That was the first one. 
And she taught him over a two-year period how to read and write. And his friend, which was the second one, got so jealous, he wanted her to teach him too. So he started writing the Marta to learn how to read and write. Isn't that something? It only takes a spark. Only a spark. No wonder Dietrich Bonhoeffer, at the close of World War II and just before his death, called for a religionless Christianity. He wanted us to get beyond custom and ritual and tradition. Those are okay. They're fine. If they are more than just habit. They've got to be expressions of the soul and they have to nourish the soul. They have to transform the soul or they're meaningless. The number one element in our worship or in our life ought to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. I stayed east of Atlanta and uh, the place I stayed was, I, I didn't know it at the time, but it was, uh, it, it was a violent area in, in Atlanta. And I didn't know it. You know, I didn't do a poll or anything or read anything about it. I just found a convenient motel near the Marta. Well, one morning, about 1 a.m., I'd been doing some reading. I was hungry. My pretzel from 2 o'clock in the afternoon had worn off, and 1 a.m., uh, I was hungry, and so I got in the car and drove a mile or so down the road at 1 a.m. and saw this little mom and pop diner and pulled up and went in. And I sat down. And, in, and I, I sat down and I, I was just looking down and I knew somebody was standing there and I looked up and there was this big black female standing there. I mean, she was huge, and she was black, black. And she had a kind of halfway grin on her face. She said, Sugar, why are you here? I said, hungry? She said, no, Sugar. Why are you here? I said, hungry? She said, no. She said, there's some evil in this room, and they would want to put evil on you. You don't look up. Yes, ma'am. She said, I'll bring you something to eat. And she brought me something. I can't remember what it was now. But uh, I didn't look up. I kept my eyes on my plate. And uh, eventually she came back over and filled my coffee cup. And she said, uh, um, and he, she called him by name. She said, the cook is going to come over and talk to you. Yes, ma'am. So I sat there with my eyes in my coffee cup, and he came over, and he says, we got a couple of minutes, and he said, when I start walking toward the door, you follow me. I said, yes, sir. And um, as soon as he started walking towards the door, I got up, and I started for the door with him, and he walked me to my car. And I got in the car, and as I drove away, I looked over at the diner, and there was all these faces looking in the winter, in the, in the windows at me and my waitress standing there going like this. <laughs> she was so glad I was out of there. It only takes a spark. And she was, the courage that for her to take that. There was a lot of courage for her to do what she did. There was a lot of courage for the cook to do what he did. But they looked after me, a stranger. A stranger, a complete stranger, had no business being where I was, but they, they looked after me and cared for me. I'm going to finish with this. Some years ago, uh, a church I pastored, and I may have some witnesses back here in the sanctuary. They're, they're from that church. Um, we started a rig service there, Rejoicing in Grace, and it was on Tuesday nights. And uh, it was primarily for uh, AA and NA groups and we had a great time and one night I was going to serve and it may have been the first night we were going to serve communion I can't remember now but I was going to serve communion we would just put a little table out front 
And I was standing there and I was about to go into the great Thanksgiving when the door opened and in came this fellow and he just walked right down the center aisle and he got in front of me and he knelt down in front of me, in front of the table. And I, what do you do? Well, I broke the bread. I didn't say a word. I just broke the bread. And I gave him the bread. And as I gave him the bread, his hands were doing like this. And you know what I automatically thought. His hands were trembling. And then I gave him the wine. And he stood and he said, thank you. And he went right back out the door. You know? A couple days later, he shows up in the study. I didn't see him between that moment and, and the day he showed up in the study. I only got to see him for about 45 minutes total. And he was in my study and he told me the story. He had been sitting beside the chapel, facing the cemetery. Chapel to his left with a 38 under his chin, ready to pull the trigger. He had a $1,500 a month addiction. When the chapel lights came on, and he looks over and he sees the stained glass lit up. And his mind goes back to his childhood in the church he grew up in, had stained glass and like this had, this, had the pictures of the life of Jesus around. And he started thinking about those pictures and the life of Jesus. And people started showing up in the park a lot. Somebody showed up on a motorcycle, somebody showed up in a BMW, then another one showed up on, in a truck that was falling apart, you know, and just all kinds of escalades and different stripes and fashions and stuff all showed up and he heard them laughing and chuckling going into the church and he put the gun down on the floor of the car and he came in now he told that story and I never saw him again he left on wherever he was going because he, we were on not far from the interstate, and he just happened to get off there. I think the holy had something to do with it, but he happened to get off there, and we were about a mile away, and he drove around uh, the community and happened in our parking lot. And then he went on his way after telling the story. But I came to find, I came to find out his hands were trembling, not because of an addiction that I thought was the cause. His hands were trembling because he recognized the power that's in that bread. He sensed the power of transformation that's in that wine. And he was ready to change. God is out there not putting patches on our old garments, but bringing a new garment. God is not out there putting new wine in old skins. He's bringing new wine and new skins. If God is at the heart, why are we so frightened? Is it simply because of change and being comfortable? I believe everyone in this room in some form or fashion wants to go with God. That you're not willing to stay as you are. That you are ready to become more than you are. I believe we want to go with God and have God do a new thing in our home in our workplaces, in our friendship gatherings, in our church, on the Grand Strand. I believe that. But it takes courage. And it takes faith. Because change out there will mean change in here. Wasn't it Mahatma Gandhi? that said, be the change you want to see in the world. 
So if, if we want our homes to change, be the change. You institute. If you want your workplace to change, be the change. If you want our church to change, be the change you want. If you want the Grand Strand to change, be the change. To his fledgling church, Jesus spoke, and to his postmodern church today, he still speaks. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have given unto you, and lo, and this is the, the security, and lo, I am with you always, even till the ends of the earth. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, we ask that you create in us a spark, a spark of hope, a spark of faith, and the courage to fan that spark into a white glow and set us ablaze for your kingdom here on the Grand Strand. May everyone who passes by feel the warmth, the warmth of the Spirit, the war warmth of the spiritual fire that burns bright in this place. For we ask it in the sake, for the sake of your kingdom. Amen.